Good evening, everybody. This is Michael Vershow. I'm the director of the Consulting and Business Development Center at the University of Washington's Foster School of Business. So wonderful to have you all joining us tonight. I'm sorry it's on, because of uh, such terrible situations, um, but the center for the last 25 years has been working with small businesses across the state and across and around the country, um, focusing on businesses owned by people of color, women, and other underserved groups um, to support growth and development of those firms. And so it's an appropriate uh, that we are engaged in this discussion today. The session is being hosted by the Foster School of Business at the University of Washington. Our center has been around for 25 years. And not only are we joined by businesses here in Washington State, um, but we're also joined through our Ascend Network uh, that works with small businesses in 16 cities across the U.S. We're joined by business owners, entrepreneur support organizations in cities and, and towns. I think we're in 17 states across the U.S. So this is uh, a, a really important evening for all of us. Um, as we move to the next slide um, here, just wanted to remind everybody of the upcoming schedule that we have over the next um, six, uh, six remaining weeks of, of this session. Um, if you haven't registered for all of them yet, uh, please feel free to go back onto the registration site and do so. If you've already registered, then, then you're good to go. We're pleased in this opening session to have with us our Dean of the Foster School of Business, Frank Hodge. Uh, Frank became Dean of the Foster School after serving for 12 years as the Chair of the Accounting Department um, he became, but he became Dean last July, and I would bet that in his interview process, in his consideration process, um, he was not asked about whether he would be Dean during, uh, during the first uh, global pandemic in 100 years. Um, so it's been an interesting leadership experience for him. Part of what I love about working with Frank, you see his professional credentials on, on the screen here, but what I really love about working with Frank is that he was born and raised in Idaho in Montana. Um, he, so, I, so I grew up in the New York, New Jersey area, and Frank tells me he, he, he wasn't born in a town, he was born in a rural area, um, and spent the first years of his life there, and I'm not quite sure, coming from where I grew up, I'm not sure what, what he means by that. Uh, but anyway, but, but Frank uh, grew up in rural area. His first job, when, right, when he was in high school and working his way through college, was on a farm, bailing hay and laying pipe. Um, and so with, it's interesting to have both a highly accomplished professional, but also somebody who, who's leading a, a business school in a major city, but also somebody who comes from a very different um, environment than, than many of us who, who grew up in, uh, in and around cities. So Frank, uh, with that, I'll hand it over to you um, so that you can say a few words. Thank you, Michael. It's an honor to be here tonight kicking off this event, a very special event that the Foster School is able to offer the community. At the Foster School, uh, two things we strive to do is uh, build community and build connections. And I think this event does a really nice job of doing both. And so we're very proud to be sponsoring this series of, of seminars. Um, besides working in Montana and Idaho, so rural parts of, of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, I had six years of experience working part of that time in Japan, but also running a company here in Seattle. And when I was here in Seattle, I was the only employee in the company. So I know what it's like to run a small business. When I would answer the phone, if the person said, well, we want to talk to whoever does your janitorial stuff, I would say, you're talking to them. And if someone called and said, we want to talk to whoever makes the big decision, and we want to talk to the CEO, I would say, you're talking to them. <laughs> and so I have some sympathy for what it's like to run a small business and to try to get the information that you need in order to be successful in uncertain times. So I think that that's something I really appreciate about the seminar series we're offering here tonight, uh, starting tonight and, and over the next six weeks. You have some of the finest faculty at the Foster School uh, at your disposal over the next six weeks. And I think it's a wonderful opportunity to learn from them and hopefully you'll find some some useful information that will help you uh, in your businesses. I wanna say a special thank you to Michael Vosherow and his center and Jeff Schulman, a uh, faculty member that helped put this together. It, it takes a lot of effort to pull this together and they've done a wonderful, fabulous job. And so I thank them for that. And I wanna thank you as attendees for showing up tonight. I know that it's a crazy and, and busy time. And so for you to take time out of your, your day, especially in the evening to join us, I really appreciate that because we feel like we're in this together. Um, and we're a community and we're, we're going to work through this together. And this is one way we're going to do it. We're going to learn from each other. So thank you for joining us tonight. Back to you, Michael. Wonderful. Th thanks, Frank. We really appreciate you being with us. 
Um, so, as I said at the very beginning, right, we're re we're, we are recording this session. It will be available on our center's website, um, but we will also email it out to everybody who is registered um, this evening. Um, but uh, please, uh, we, we've got an, an excellent faculty member to join us uh, tonight to begin the session. Uh, Jeff Shulman is a professor of marketing um, and the Marion B. Ingersoll Professor at the Foster School of Business. Um, he received his BA, his MS, and his PhD from Northwestern University. But um, again, what makes Jeff really special besides being an outstanding teacher and an outstanding researcher is his real commitment to, uh, to, uh, to diverse communities. Um, he's produced a, a documentary that's aired on PBS about the changing demographics here in, in Seattle and the impact of gentrification on historically African-American communities. Um, and it, Jeff is also the one who's pulled together this faculty group. So what, uh, please, uh, I guess we, we can't applaud for him, but, uh, but Jeff, as we turn it over to you, know that you've got you know, 250 plus people applauding for you now. Um, so, so please take it away. All right, uh, thank you very much, Michael. And thank you everybody for, for coming here uh, tonight. Just as Frank said, uh, I'm thanking you because I know that you're not just giving us your time uh, for yourself and to better your own business, uh, but you're doing this uh, to find a way to help your employees, uh, to help your uh, customers, and really to help the communities that you serve. Small businesses are just such an incredible, uh, critical part of our economy and a really incredible and important part of our community. And so I'm happy to be here as Frank, uh, as our Dean, Dean Hodge often says, uh, with the Foster School, we're better together, uh, better, future, better tomorrow. And so we're in this together and you've got seven faculty members and a, a whole range of staff behind this who want to see you succeed. Uh, I, um, I can empathize and I want to acknowledge the devastation that many of you and many small businesses around the country are feeling right now. Uh, but I also want to acknowledge that amidst this devastation is a tremendous opportunity. And it's, it's challenging to see, it could be challenging to see, but think about it, how habitual, like how much people settle into habits, both businesses and customers, in terms of where they shop and where they spend their money. Right now, everybody's world has sadly been turned upside down. And so they're looking for new businesses, new, new places to satisfy their new needs that they have in this crisis. And so uh, my goal for this session is that you see that, this, that there is an opportunity here, that the time, this time is presenting an opportunity. So I hope, one, that at the end of this session, you definitely see this opportunity and you start seeing how you could be the ones to grab it. And so I'm going to leave you uh, with uh, frameworks and some examples and really get down to so that you could identify at least one way that you could help your business survive and then ultimately, my hope is that you thrive. Uh, and what I'm going to be talking about is what to expect in the months and years ahead. I'm going to talk about how you can go about understanding the new needs that, are, that your customers might be experiencing. And then adapting your marketing mix. So how can you change your product, your price, your promotion, and or your placement so that you could rise to the occasion, so that you can meet the needs of the people of Seattle or the people, that, uh, people and businesses that you might be serving from uh, around the world. So after I cover those three parts, uh, we're gonna have breakout sessions. Again, Foster School of Business, I really bought into to Dean Hodge's slogan, better together, better tomorrow. And I think that by bringing you together, uh, you're going to be able to apply what you've talked about here, what, what I've talked about here in this session, and start getting ideas about how other people are thinking about adapting their business based off of what you hear from me today. Uh, if at any point you have a question, as uh, Michael said, you could go through the Q&A button, and I'll have several pauses throughout where Michael will then read me what kind of questions you might have, and I'll also give a pause where you could uh, take time to write a question if you instead are taking notes or listening carefully. Uh, so, um, what to expect? You know, I think the first thing to realize is this is the new normal. There's going to be a lot of uh, dynamicism going on. There's a lot of change. Uh, and the coronavirus is going to be impacting our lives uh, for the months to come. And so, it's important to realize that even when the stay-at-home restrictions are lifted here in Washington 
or wherever, whatever state that, that you do business in, even when the stay at home orders are, are lifted, there's no magic wand, no magic bullet. Uh, th- life is going to change. And my goal is that you see that change as an opportunity that you you learn that you see how to adapt to it and thrive in this new normal. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is what you could expect in terms of the types of customers uh, going forward, how people will be reacting to all the changes here. Uh, so one one of your one type of customer that that you, of people who you're probably previously were serving are the people who even if the stay at home orders are lifted are still gonna wanna stay at home. And so they're gonna stay indoors. And it's important for us to think as businesses, how could we adapt to the needs of the person? Uh, How could we address the needs of the person who is still not gonna go outside uh, or limit going outside as much as possible? Second thing to realize is even though uh, there might be, there's gonna be a segment of customers who are ready to go outdoors and ready to uh, go back to a normal routine, but they need to feel safe doing so. And so it's going to be really important that you um, address their safety needs and reassure them that it it is safe and okay to go back to using your business or or working with your business. Um, And then many of you are probably following this, but there is going to be people working from home for months and months to come. Here in Seattle, many of the tech employers have extended their stay at home till October, uh, some even till the end of the year. And we're seeing Twitter has said their employees can stay at home indefinitely. And so even when the restrictions are lifted, there is still going to be a lot of people working from home and that's going to affect where they shop, what they shop for, and and, and their needs are going to be different than before this pandemic. And I, I uh, can't give that, that, I can't give enough emphasis on the fact that, you know, even with the psychological trauma of the coronavirus that will persist, there is going to be an economic trauma. Uh, so many customers have lost their jobs. Uh, so many businesses have sadly uh, closed. And so their spending is down for obvious reasons. But then even the other businesses and the consumers that are holding on, they now realize that it could be them. And so you're going to see a lot of people and businesses starting to pinch pennies, starting to look uh, at every at every expenditure and try to, to again, uh, hold on for that rainy day that they've seen happen to so many of their peers. And so I tell you this uh, because each of these four types of customers, their needs have evolved and ha- what they're looking for from you has changed. And so by recognizing that there's these different types of of reactions or different types of customers, uh, you can then start to identify what are their new needs and how could you adapt within your ethos and within your values to meet those needs. And I wanna clarify too, these aren't necessarily distinct customers. Uh, So you might find that somebody is both working from home and afraid to go out Uh, Or you might find that somebody is working from home and when they go out, they want to feel assured and and feel safe. Uh, Or you might find that somebody fits three of these categories. But the key is with each of these kind of differences in the, in the consumer, they have different needs and we need to figure out how could we serve them uh, in the world ahead? Because all four of these types of customers are going to persist for months, uh, if not uh, into next, into the next year. So now I want to transition. How do we go about understanding these new needs? And I want to talk about two aspects of this, customer journey mapping, and uh, I want to give you some tips for interviewing customers. So customer journey mapping, what is it? It, It's where we think about a typical uh, day or a typical journey by which a customer uh, would satisfy the need that your product satisfies. So everywhere from identifying the need to searching for alternatives, all the way through how they use the product. And what I challenge you to do is for each of those four types of customers, you know, the person who's afraid to leave their house, uh, the person who's gonna leave their house but wants to feel assured that it's safe to do so with your business, Uh, the, the person or business that is suffering economically or is watching every penny, Uh, And the person who uh, is working from home, where their family might be there or where there's, uh, you know, no transition between 
work time and play time and so on. So each of those four customers will go through a different journey with your product and now have different problems than they had before. So a typical journey, this is just one example, going from need recognition, okay, my need recognition is maybe I need a new furnace or I'm hungry. Uh, evaluating alternatives, uh, thinking about, okay, do I eat at um, uh, Marjorie's or do I eat at Art of the Table? Um, and then how do they evaluate those alternatives? How do they complete the transaction? You know, everything from where do they hand over the credit card? Do they, what pen do they use to sign? You know, think through completing the transaction and everything about using the product or service. Um, and then think about the coronavirus and the COVID-19 reality and where do your current processes create problems for the customers as they exist today? So at this point, I wanna pause and give Michael a chance to chime in if anybody has had a question. So if you have a question, you could type it in Q&A. And if somebody's already asked a question based off of what I've talked about so far, Michael can uh, chime in with that question here. Great, Jeff, we do have a question actually. Um, somebody, so somebody writes in, uh, pivoting to new areas in high demand requires the right capabilities, the right capital, and overcoming barriers to entry. To avoid using this as an excuse, how can a small business accomplish this in such challenging times and on a short time frame with limited funds? Uh, yeah, that's a very important question. So I, I'm not talking about a pivot in this case. Next week, we'll talk about pivots. I'm talking about making incremental changes to meet the needs of your customers where they are. And I'm going to give you a whole bunch of examples, not a whole bunch, uh, as many examples as I can in the short amount of time here. Uh, but we'll get to how do you adapt to the needs in a little bit. At this point, I want to just take questions on uh, what to expect and what, why do we customer journey map and how do we do it and what might we get from it? Okay, so let, let, let's try this question then, Jeff. Um, so, so Liz writes in, um, how would you translate customer journey from consumer to under, wait, let's see, let me, sorry, let me try that again. How would you translate customer journey from consumer to understanding their journey with a business? Offering business services, i.e. communications management, for example. Yeah, so it's, you go through and say, what does that business do? What is the need that's drawing them to your business as it was or as it is? Uh, what's drawing, it, drawing that business to work with you? Uh, so what's the need that, that, that they have? How do they go about deciding whether to work with you or some other competitors or existing options? Uh, how do they work with you? Uh, how do they complete the transaction, whether that's what they, how they pay you, uh, how they are invoiced, how they... Um, make the order. So whatever it is, how do they work with you? And just march through from need recognition to satisfaction and hopefully even word of mouth. And then think about what is the, so if for that, maybe the economic reality might be the biggest change. So maybe they don't have the same resources that they had yesterday. Uh, and so think about uh, what are the problems with their current journey uh, that are created by the lack of discretionary spending? Is there an example that comes to mind, Jeff, uh, for that? Like, you know, could you walk us through, like, you know, if you were, you know, pick, pick a business, you know, and, and walk us through how that might work in a particular business? You know, it's hard to just do in a, in a quick example. What I want to tell you is that as you map, you think about what are the stages, and then you want to think about what are they thinking, feeling, and doing at each of these stages. So I, I'll give you one example. So, uh, uh, somebody who is really scared and wants to be assured that they're safe. So need, and let's talk about going to a restaurant. So they need recognition is they recognize they're hungry. They look in their fridge and recognize that there's nothing that they would like to eat. And so they start thinking, where can I order from? And so the evaluating alternatives, uh, some might just go to Uber Eats and scroll down based off of the best rated. Uh, others might go online. And then some, the person who's staying at home might Google places that offer curbside delivery. And so uh, then when it comes to completing the transaction, they might then call the place and say, hey, what does your curbside delivery look like? Will you be putting the car, will you be putting the food in my trunk or am I going to have to, to uh, get within six feet of your worker or uh, am I going to have to uh, share my credit card back and forth? Um, and then they take the food home and they throw the, uh, they throw the, they eat it and they throw the wrappers away. 
And you want to find out what are they thinking, feeling, and doing at each stage so that you can see where does your current processes create pain? Where does it create a problem? Uh, and so you could do this as a thought exercise, but I highly recommend talking to your customer. And so now I want to transition to interviewing. How do you to get to Michael's real question, to get to Michael's question, how do you put together this journey map? Well, you ask the customer. So it starts with the best way to ask a customer is to have open-ended questions. Put your journalist hat on and think who, what, where, when, why, and how. So it, uh, interview examples. What do you do when? So here, if you, if you uh, sell glasses, you say, what do you do when your glasses break? Or what do you do when, if you're selling a furnace, if you're a furnace repair, uh, you say, what do you do when your furnace breaks or your air conditioning breaks? Uh, what do you do when you're hungry? Uh, in these ellipses, in the dot, dot, dots, you're adding in kind of the prompt. You're adding in the, uh, what is it that has, what is, been triggered in their mind that you know is what draws them to you. So uh, what do you do when you need new clothes? What do you do when uh, you want to tell somebody you love them? Uh, it, so whatever it is that draws them to your business, uh, ask them what is it that they do when they recognize that when that problem arises. Uh, and then find out when do they have this problem? So this will help you see uh, when, when you, if you know when somebody realizes they have a problem, then uh, you can make your marketing message reach them at the point at which they have the problem. Uh, where do you look for information? So this is that second part of the journey where they know they have a problem and they're starting to look to see what, uh, what different companies can satisfy that problem. Uh, and so asking them where do they look for information helps you see what information you need to present. So going back to my restaurant example, do you look on Uber Eats to see what information is posted about safety precautions? Uh, do you look to blogs or uh, Google searches? Uh, or do you call? Do you call your favorite restaurants and ask them? And this will again help you realize where do you need to put information about what you're doing to satisfy their needs? Um, who do you consider? So this will help you see what your competitors are doing or who your competitors are for that customer. Um, how do you choose among the alternatives? This will help you realize what changes do you need to make in the COVID-19 reality? What is new to them now? What, so they, might, they never cared about where your seating is and how far away it is from other customers, or they never cared about uh, whether your uh, waiters and waitresses are using masks and gloves but now they might start to care about things that you might not have even thought of. So asking your customers, how do they choose among alternatives will help you understand what's important to them. And another way is, you know, what is important in your decision? Uh, so what is important? Again, this will help you not only craft your product, but craft what message that you share with them. And then a critical question to always be asking is why, why, why? So ask why in as many different ways as you can so that you could get to the root of what they need and so that you could truly uh, address that need through your product and also communicate that you have addressed the need that they have. So at this point, I want to welcome any questions about the interview process. So how might you, uh, so I've shared questions that you could ask to interview your existing customers and the goal is if you know what challenges coronavirus is creating for your existing customers and you satisfy that need, you'll be able to draw new customers as well who likely have similar needs. Michael? So Jeff, we have a, a question about, is that exactly about that of how do we collect um, information from customers and clients? I mean, if, if we're not seeing them in person, right? If we're yep. interacting with them uh, online or otherwise, how do we get the information that you're asking about from customers? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I would recommend, again, uh, starting with your existing customers and truly understanding their needs and how they've changed. Uh, because your existing customers, you have a relationship with them. They mean some, you mean something to them and they want to see you succeed because you've satisfied their needs in the past and they would likely want to see you continue to satisfy those needs. So you might have an email. Uh, hopefully you have a mailing list. Um, if you don't interact with your customers because they're not coming in, uh, you could send out a, a mailer 
an, an email to say, hey, we want to better serve your needs. Uh, who's willing to give us 20 minutes of your time, 30 minutes of your time? Uh, and then you might even offer an enticement. So we'll give you free, our free service for a week or a free month um, or a free meal, whatever it is that you offer. Uh, you could give them an enticement. Uh, sometimes you might not even need an enticement because they, uh, again, small businesses are just such an important part of the community that many people want to see you succeed. And so you might first try just, hey, we want to better serve your needs. Uh, will you please talk to us? And then you set up a Zoom link and you could talk to them uh, just like this or even a phone call if needed. Uh, any other questions, Michael? Yeah, Jeff. And, and actually, uh, the, what you just said leads, leads nicely into the next question is that people are asking about are you, are you saying that we, you know, formal surveys, right? You know, which are, you can then you have to do all the statistical analysis and that sort of thing. You know, how sophisticated or how in-depth, you know, surveys are you talking about here to get feedback yeah. from customers? Excellent question. You know, it, it really depends on your bandwidth and how much confidence you have in understanding the needs. Again, there's those four types of customers and their needs are now different than they were before. Again, the person who's staying at home, the person who wants to go out, but is just needs to be assured that it's safe. Uh, the person who's watching every penny or the business that's watching every penny and the uh, person who's working from home. And so you could do a survey, uh, but people are often, they often have trouble articulating what they want. And so that's the benefit of trying to set up at least a couple of interviews to start to explore uh, what new needs are, are arising. Um, I would highly recommend an interview uh, and highly recommend really understanding, uh, being able to ask these follow-up questions. Uh, if not, you could do a survey where you say what's important to you, uh, where we, what do you love about what we do, and what would you like to see us improve? And those three questions uh, could give you some valuable answers. But I personally think if you have the time, and I understand we're being pulled in a million directions right now, if you have the time, I'd highly recommend sitting down and talking, uh, sorry, sitting down, standing up, however it is you're going to do virtually, talk to a customer and be able to ask those probing questions. And maybe the final one before we let you get on with the rest of it, Jeff, is num numbers of people you need to interview, right? I mean, what, one person's a, a data point, it's not a trend, right? I mean, how many people do you need to, to talk to or to interview but, but as you're making decisions? Yeah, you know, I generally, rule of thumb is three to five within a certain segment. So I would try to put them into buckets and say, okay, this, is the, this person's not leaving their house or this person wants to leave their house but is working from home, um, you know, kind of put them in buckets and you might have different uh, segments of your own, but really try to categorize them, find somebody who fits that profile. And then if you ask why enough, you're really getting to the root of what that problem is. And you could start to use your judgment as to how important or pervasive that problem really is. Uh, and again, we're not talking about a business pivot. I, I, you had that earlier question, you know, like we've seen business pivots where a, a, a large scale manufacturer pivots from making a um, apparel to making PPE. Uh, that's great. And I'd encourage you to think about where there's new opportunities. But this talk is really just about finding a way to serve your existing customers. And in doing that and delighting them, the word could spread where you could start to uh, get additional customers. Um, so we're not talking about you need a, a full range investment. We're talking about, you know, making small minor changes uh, that help adapt, that have a big impact in adapting to the new reality. Great, thanks, Jeff. And, and your, your, our colleague, Emer Dooley, who is leading the session next week, um, chimed in on the questions that, that she'll be addressing, those bigger pivot questions in the session next week. Excellent. And, and I, I want to say it is important to consider whether the time is to do a, a major what we call pivot, where you're switching who your customers are and what you do. Uh, I don't know that everybody has to do that, even if you know, you're a restaurant and you're shut down or you're a um, a fitness center or um, studio that you need to, uh, there's still things that you could do without doing a major pivot uh, that can make a major difference. And I'm going to talk about those and uh, just a few nuggets of wisdom for each of them and uh, some examples to help you start to think about how to think about it. So adapting the marketing mix, the marketing mix commonly known as the four P's. Uh, the four P's stand for product, price, placement, and promotion. And I'm going to talk about uh, some rules of thumb or, or some tips for each of these uh, elements of the marketing mix. For one, uh, the product. Again, thinking through situation, complication, resolution. 
This is where you say, what is the situation in which somebody uses your product? What is the complication created by the coronavirus? And how could you resolve it? And again, that complication might be because of the economic trauma. That complication might be because of the psychological trauma. Or that complication might be because of, you know, the change in the workplace where people are now working from home. But think about what is the complication that makes it that your product no longer satisfies the needs in the way that it did, and how could you resolve that? And so I just want to give uh, a few examples of small businesses that realize coronavirus created a complication and that they found ways to change their product to resolve that complication. The Pilates company in Woodenville, so they run a, uh, a studio and clearly the stay at home orders, people are no longer allowed to go to uh, fitness centers or uh, fitness studios. So they started broadcasting their live classes online. And this is one step, so you, you move to online, but this company didn't just, this small business didn't just say, all right, we're gonna try to do the same thing online. They were very thoughtful. They said, what is it about the in-person experience that's so important? And how do we make the online experience replicate that as closely as possible? And so the, they realized that they needed, that music was an integral part of the experience. And so they found a way to get the music to go on, in a virtual environment. And they found, they cleared the proper music licenses. And so uh, thinking through, the, another thing they thought through is community. So the community of the classes is really important. So they tried to find ways to replicate the sense of community in the online environment. Uh, another example is Art of the Table, a fine dining restaurant uh, here in Seattle, uh, transitioned like many others to takeout. And so they've, they, each uh, day they have two special um, fixed meals and uh, you could order it ahead of time and pick it up and, and take it home. Uh, so again, we're seeing adaptation, whereas previously they only sold in their dining area and a big part of it was the experience. Uh, they transferred that to try to, again, have chef curated meals, uh, but that you could take at home. Uh, another creative innovation is Book Larder. Uh, and I apologize if I've mispronounced that, but uh, they are trying to, again, like the Pilates company, replicate that in-person experience in this new COVID-19 reality. And so they have FaceTime appointments where you could uh, relive that experience of browsing through the shelves and getting expert guidance on, on the, what book is right for you. But again, in the new world, it's now virtual. So it's not just let's, let's, let's just hop on virtual and that's the solution to everything, but rather what is it that people loved about coming together in the physical space and how do we thoughtfully curate our virtual world uh, to recreate some of that magic? And so the takeaway from these three examples is there are changes to your product that are either brought upon you uh, through the stay at home orders, or there's changes that are brought upon you by the fact that, uh, you know, again, somebody might be fearful or they might not have the financial resources. Uh, you know, there's been a change in their lives that the, that the product as it was can no longer satisfy their needs. And so by interviewing them and really thinking through the journey and where the complication is presented, then you can start to think about how can you resolve uh, that complication through changes to the product. Um, now I wanna move on to price. And this is a, an expression that my MBA students somehow remember almost a decade after I, I shared it with them. Uh, and they continue to remember it in the years that I keep sharing it with them. But this sticks is that, and I want it to stick with you, prices are like gravity. Once they start to fall, they are really hard to get back up. So think about that. I've told you there's a whole group of customers in business uh, who are tightening their belts. And so an, a common instinct is to lower your prices. Let me use price as a call to action. But there's two problems with that. One, while many people sadly are really struggling right now economically, there are also businesses and individuals who are doing quite well. And they would happily pay you money for satisfying their need. And so I challenge you to think about how can you still 
get that price from the people willing to pay you it and happily pay you uh, while accommodating uh, the community members that are suffering economically and finding a way to still meet their needs. Um, the second reason I tell you that to not just lower your prices around the board is that if you look at previous recessions, the companies that lower their prices during the recession are slow to bounce back during an economic recovery. And so it, this goes down to what's called prospect theory. Uh, but once somebody buys something at a certain price, they don't want to pay more for that same thing. And, and even if the times have gotten better. So don't lower your prices across the board because one, there's somebody who's willing to pay you more for it happily right now. And two, uh, lowering your prices across the board will stall your, your recovery uh, when our global economy uh, starts to recover. So what can you do instead? I wanna give you some creative examples. Uh, one is from a small business, again, going back to the Pilates company, they did pay as you wish pricing. Now you might explore pay as you wish pricing for your business, but I caution you, there were two things that made it work in their case. One, there were low variable costs. So having one more person join a virtual class didn't cost them anything. And two, they had a strong sense of community uh, they had a strong connection with their customers. And so people who could pay wanted to pay so that they could keep this resource available to them and to others. And so you might consider if you have a strong community of people who really treasure what you do and you have low or non-existent variable costs, the cost of serving one more customer, you might consider pay as you wish pricing as a means to help those who are struggling while still uh, keeping the lights on. Um, and the interesting story with this, they, while a fitness studio you would think would be suffering the most right now, they have doubled their revenue. So the Pilates company has doubled their revenue by using pay-as-you-wish pricing in the middle of this global pandemic. Uh, here are some examples. I want to give you examples that we could tell you what happened in the recovery. And so Starbucks did what we call versioning. So instead of during the last recession in 2009, instead of lowering the prices of their lattes, they released Starbucks Via. So it was ready to brew an instant coffee. So this was a dollar, whereas lattes are, you know, several dollars. And what this did was when the economic recovery kicked in, they were still able to charge the really high prices on lattes um, while still serving this segment uh, who was struggling economically with this uh, ready brew. And then I would encourage you to use value as a call to action instead of instantly pulling the price lever and saying, hey, keep working with us because we're cheap, uh, start saying, hey, work with us because we're gonna add more value. Uh, and so a MBA student of mine worked at the, a hotel group here in Seattle and they found, they held the blind on price and gave extras like room upgrades, uh, meal vouchers, uh, extra amenities, massages, and so on. They gave extras to justify uh, the expenditure. And when the, when the economy recovered, they were able to return to pre-recession prices because they were already there, whereas it took years for their competitors to return uh, uh, to pre-recession prices. So again, uh, what you do now and during this crisis is going to affect what you could do for years to come. Try versioning, try value as a call to action, uh, try anything but just lowering your prices across the board. Um, I want to say placement that is Keep, uh, where your product is available. Uh, consumers are changing, businesses are changing where and how they want to buy. So I, uh, you know, as I said, thousands of highly paid workers who were coming downtown to work every five, day, five days a week, they're not returning uh, through the end of the year. And so I encourage you to reevaluate how can you be available where they are um, and maybe how can you reduce expenses? So how could you save on costs that are not adding value or that are not helping solve the need of where and how people want to buy or work with your product or service? So that might mean pop-ups. That means virtual, could mean virtual. Uh, it could mean uh, sharing a kitchen if you're a restaurant. Um, it could mean moving locations. So really think through where do people uh, want to buy in this COVID reality as their patterns have shifted and how could you be there with the way that they want to buy your product or service. 
promotion, and I'm going to wrap up uh, with this. Uh, promotion, I really want you to think through what is the need and when and where is this need recognized so that you could communicate what, what problem you solve and communicate that where people are ready to hear it. So I want to give one example from a friend of mine who's got a small business in Michigan. Uh, he realized that a lot of people were walking by their restaurant. The, 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 he has a bakery and people were walking by their bakery, but maybe they were afraid to go in. And so he wanted them to know that they have curbside pickup and delivery available. Uh, this was before the stay at home orders, but when people were starting to be fearful. Uh, and you might think once the stay at home orders are lifted, uh, you might want to have a similar sign if you think that the, your customers need to know this information and that's where they'd be looking for it. But what I really think is cool about this story is somebody asked earlier, how do we switch everything with, you know, the capital expense and all the big investments it takes? He, uh, he and his wife, uh, the, the two of them, uh, they changed what they were selling without changing what they were selling. So they sell bunt cakes. And before they were really sailing away to, selling away to satisfy your hunger. But in the COVID-19 pandemic, he realized that there was a need to, to, to sell. There was a need for people to show their gratitude for their fellow humans. There was a need to show, uplift each other's spirits. And so he decided instead of just selling uh, food and sweets, he was selling a way of showing that you care. And with the Choose Joy campaign, uh, they donated 1,200 uh, cakes to local hospitals. And then they, cre they, they shared cakes with several individuals with a special note that said, choose joy. We want to uplift your spirits during these trying times. And what happened is people who received the choose joy, I appreciate you card and cake, they decided that they wanted to buy a thank you and respect for their fellow uh, friends and family. And so uh, this went viral. And in order for it to go viral, he realized that people needed to see uh, at the delivery that somebody got something special. So they invested in updating their packaging at, the, at this delivery so that people see that somebody got something special. They want to know what it is and they want to then get something special themselves. And so by selling cakes, but se instead of just selling cakes, selling love, selling joy, selling respect and kindness, uh, they were able to keep all of their employees through, uh, up until now, and they're still going. But I mean, the, the success story is they still have all their employees and their revenues have increased uh, rather than decreased. So again, another company that you would think would be hard hit by the global pandemic found a way to change on the margins, change their promotions, and are able to be successful and even more successful than before this crisis hit. Michael, was there any other questions on adapting the four P's and uh, the examples I gave? Um, yeah, yes, there were. Um, mostly the questions were around templates and samples of surveys and those sorts of things. Um, and Jeff, I'm wondering whether if uh, you'd be open to me saving those questions, sending them to you, and then when we send out the link for the video, um, we, you can respond that way to everybody so that we can get to the small group sessions. Uh, sure, let's get to the small groups. Uh, and again, sorry, I think it's important that one of your takeaways with the interviews is you just have to think through what do they go from when they need your product or service to when they've finished using it and start talking to people. Don't be afraid of templates and being scientifically rigorous. Just have your empathy for your customer and, and you will listen. If you listen, you will learn so much about what they're worried about and what challenges that have now been created by COVID-19. Uh, and that will be very valuable as you then, you have to experiment and try new things to get to uh, what, what could solve the, those needs. So I would encourage you, don't wait for a template, don't wait for specific interview questions. I'd get out there and just start thinking through what do you do next, what do you do next, why, why, and why, um, and truly understand where the COVID-19 has changed their journey. Um, so it is a new day. This is Devastating times, I understand, but there is a world of opportunity out there and we need you uh, to grab as much as you can because again, you're a critical part of the economy and you are a critical part of the communities. And so it's important to realize COVID-19 is creating new types of needs and uh, customer journey mapping, thinking through how somebody start, goes from need recognition 
to finishing using your product or service and seeing all the problems that COVID-19 is creating along that journey, that can help you understand these new needs. And you could do it as a thought exercise, but I'd encourage you to interview open-ended questions, really asking why and what happens next, what do you do next, uh, and keep following up with why to truly understand what problems they are, and you'll be able to find ways to solve them. And changes to your product, price, placement, and promotion. Uh, you, you, next week, we'll talk about, uh, Emer Dooley will talk about big pivots, but just changes and experiments with your product, price, placement, and promotion uh, can help you address these customer needs. I've shared some success stories, and I hope you know that it is possible that you too uh, can have success, and, and um, I wish you all the best.